protecting supply depots and cutting off communications. Low-flying attack planes suddenly roar over marching enemy troops, dropping bombs, and raking their soldiers with machine guns. Such tactics are highly demoralizing and difficult to combat. German strategy, too, has been characterized by an unusual boldness of conception and execution. The German generals, if left to their own devices, would probably not have carried out such a plan of attack. The military mind is generally conservative, reluctant to resort to new and untried methods. Very likely Hitler has been the driving genius. The army is the Fuhrer's pet child, his own creation. The former corporal has become the generalissimo. He rushes in where others fear to tread. Ever since he drove the hesitant German generals to occupy the Rhineland in 1936, he has called the moves and supplied the motive power. Hitler does not shrink from risking everything. With him it's a question of do or die. He has poured all of Germany's manpower and material into this gigantic effort to win a blitzkrieg. And so far his recklessness and boldness appear to have borne fruit. But this formidable military machine could never have been created if Germany's economy had not been effectively geared to the war. For many years before the outbreak of hostilities, the Nazis were hard at work to establish what they called a Wehrwirtschaft, a military economy. The sole objective was to create an invincible armament. Labor, industry, agricultural and foreign trade were mobilized in this endeavor. The standard of living was sacrificed. Considerations of private enterprise and individual freedom were overridden. Thus, from the very beginning, Germany was able to throw into this struggle its maximum economic and military strength. Finally, the Nazi campaign has been powered by a fanatic zeal and fighting spirit. Make no mistake, Nazism is a revolutionary faith. It represents a new concept of society. It revolutionizes the relationship of the individual to the community. Just as the French soldiers under Napoleon carried the French Revolution through Europe, so the Nazis are bearing the torch of revolution in one hand and the sword in the other. These thousands of young German soldiers would not display such daring and initiative unless they were inspired by a revolutionary idea and blind devotion to the German Führer. The bulk of the German people on the home front have also been rallied about the swastika. For many of them, Hitler appears at last to be realizing the true German destiny. The Nazis have cleverly exploited the feeling of the German people that they, 80 million strong, are better equipped to organize and control Europe than 47 million British or 42 million Frenchmen. For all this, the Allies were poorly prepared. The French, and particularly the British, always underestimated Hitler and the power of the Nazi movement. They indulged in too much wishful thinking about the possibility of a political or economic collapse in Germany. The flippant characterization of Hitler as a house painter or paper hanger fooled many people. Even after war broke out, the Allies relied too much on a static conception of warfare. They believed that their superiority of economic and financial resources would tell in the end, and that the Germans could be starved out. The comparative inactivity of Germany after the Polish campaign encouraged the Allies in the conviction that they would have ample time to mobilize the military and economic strength needed to deliver the final blow. They moved far too slowly in stepping up production of armament. In Britain particularly, the government and people were too reluctant to interfere with normal business and shoulder the heavy sacrifices required for the grim task of war. We as Americans, however, would do well not to be too severe in our strictures of the Allies. Few of us can rightfully claim that we foresaw all this or that we fully realized the scope of Nazi ambitions and the extent of German power. Otherwise, we too might have taken measures. Nor could anyone have predicted the ease with which the Dutch, Belgian, and French defense works crumbled before the German onslaught. Hitherto, there had been little reason to question the adage that the power of defense usually keeps space with the development of offensive weapons. 
The Allied military situation is not, of course, wholly beyond repair. There are still opportunities for effective counterattack before the Germans have consolidated their positions. In a daring plan of campaign such as the German, crucial mistakes may yet be made. The Germans are drawing heavily on their reserves of manpower and material without being able to replace them as rapidly. Their supplies are not inexhaustible. Meanwhile, the grave emer emergency has at last galvanized the Allies into energetic action. In Britain, the Churchill government has awakened the people to the gravity of the situation. A law giving the cabinet sweeping authority to conscript labor and national wealth has been rushed through Parliament. New and energetic men are directing the various ministries dealing with the production of aircraft, munitions, and the mobilization of labor. Measures have also been taken to combat an invasion. Everyone is putting his shoulder to the wheel. In France, too, reorganization has been the order of the day. A shake-up in the army has placed General Vegong, an old disciple of Foch, in command. The premier has appealed to every soldier to stand his ground. The Frenchman will fight bitterly to defend his beloved native soil. But all these efforts may come too late. Unquestionably, the Allies are now battling against almost overwhelming odds. The enemy has seized a large part of supplies stored in northern France and in the Channel port, and Allied pilots are approaching exhaustion in their gallant attempts to combat German superiority in the air. We in this country must resolutely face the prospect and consequences of a Nazi victory in Europe. If Hitler wins, we must be prepared for the disappearance of democratic institutions in Europe. We must even expect that the British and French will keenly resent our unwillingness to give them more effective aid. We may see a fascist United States of Europe. The French and British empires may be disrupted. In Africa, Germany may acquire colonies in close proximity to South America. In Europe, the Nazis expect to organize a vast continental market and a production machine which undoubtedly would have tremendous economic bargaining power in Latin America and other countries overseas. The British Navy, which has stood between us and Europe, would be wiped out. And in the Far East, the disposition of French, British, and Dutch colonies would confront us with burning questions. While we must face the fact there is no excuse, there is no cause for panic and hysteria. There is no danger of invasion in the immediate future. German parachute troops will not be landed, nor will, New, nor will New York be bombarded overnight. The fear of fifth columns does not justify indiscriminate measures against German Americans, German refugees, or other elements on the mere suspicion that they may all be guilty of treason or spying. What then must we do? First of all, there is need for a sober and intelligent reappraisal of our position in the world. We must carefully examine what we want to defend and how we shall defend it. We must not become too alarmed by the many charges that the billions hitherto spent for national defense have simply been poured down the sink. In reality, we have a first-class navy. We also possess a larger peacetime army than ever before. Of course, this country must now revamp its defense program to meet this new situation which has arisen. We can no longer count on the British Navy as the first bulwark of our defense. The possibility of establishing an adequate defense system for the entire Western Hemisphere will have to be examined. We may be compelled to take over the possession of European of European powers on the American continent in order to keep them out of German hands. And we must also tackle energetically those bottlenecks in our production program which may hamper us in carrying out our armament program. This will involve the training of more skilled labor and the building of additional plants here and there. Adequate supplies of certain raw materials like rubber and tin will have to be secured. To this end, we shall need to study the possibility and desirability of striving for hemispheric economic self-sufficiency. We cannot neglect one other task, perhaps the most vital one, and that is 
the reinforcement of our spiritual defenses. The democratic world has had one fault in common. We have permitted our institutions to lose a certain amount of vitality. We have taken our freedom too much for granted. We are no longer so eager and enthusiastic to defend it against the challenge of newer and more dynamic philosophies of government. In other words, the fighting spirit has largely gone out of democracy. There has also been too much strife and dissension, too little solidarity and unity. Very often freedom has been treated not as a great privilege, but as a means to acquire selfish advantage. Perhaps this war in Europe will not have been entirely in vain if it brings about a revival of the national spirit in our own country. We may yet attain a greater appreciation of our liberties and a renewed determination to defend them. But at the same time, there must be less political sniping and a greater willingness to pull in harness. Without these, democracy cannot work. This country need not fall victim to defeatism. To use a German phrase, we have ample living space on this hemisphere. In a common effort with the other American countries, we can create a great commonwealth resting upon cooperation rather than coercion. Opportunities are not lacking. Our resources are immense, and we have the technical ingenuity to use them. There is no reason why we should not be able to expand our production for defense and still maintain and advance our living standards. No need we sacrifice social progress. Our farms produce a surplus of food. We have millions of idle men and plenty of idle industrial capacity. We can and must put them to work. The essential condition is that government, industry, and labor pull together in a true cooperative spirit. Let us all put our shoulders to the wheel. Mr. John C. DeWilda, research associate of the Foreign Policy Association, was today's speaker in the America Looks Abroad series. If you would like a copy of this talk, send your request to the Foreign Policy Association, number 8, West 40th Street, New York City. And we invite you to tune in next Sunday to hear another speaker in the series America Looks Abroad. This is the National Broadcasting Company, RCA Building, Radio City, New York.